2012 is a very exciting year for astronomers. First of all, we have a pair of solar eclipses, an annular eclipse on May 20th that will be visible in California through Texas, and a total eclipse that will be visible in Australia in November. But there are eclipses every year, total eclipse every year and a half. What's very unusual about 2012 is that we will have a transit of Venus. It will be the last transit of Venus until the year 2117. So if you ever want to see a transit of Venus, this is your chance. So what's a transit of Venus? Well, Copernicus in 1543 figured out that the sun and not the earth is at the center of what we therefore now call the solar system. He has a beautiful diagram in his book from 1543 with Sol, Latin for sun, at the center. And this was a major change in people's thinking about the universe. If you look at his diagram, or any diagram of the solar system, you can see that Mercury and Venus are the only two planets who orbit within the Earth's orbit, and therefore only Mercury and Venus could go between the Earth and the Sun. When one of them goes across the face of the Sun, we call that a transit. Now their orbits are slanted a tiny bit, so they sometimes go a little above or a little below the line between the Earth and the Sun. So most times when they go around, they don't go right between the Earth and the Sun. But a couple of times per hundred or so years, Venus goes in transit across the face of the Sun, and about 15 or 16 times per century, Mercury goes in transit across the face of the Sun. Not only is this an odd event and something that is very difficult to be alive when it happens for, but also it used to be what was called the Noble Experiment. It was the major point in astronomy and astrophysics for hundreds of years because it was the only way they had for hundreds of years of finding out how big the solar system is. And since the solar system was essentially the universe, it was essentially the question of how big is the universe? Certainly an existential question that everybody wanted to know. Following Copernicus in 1543, at the end of that century, the end of the 16th century, Tycho Brahe in Denmark made major observations of the uh, planets, the positions of the planets, and the positions of the stars. And uh, when he got expelled from, uh, from Denmark, uh, Tycho uh, brought his observations to Prague, where he took on a young assistant, Johannes Kepler, and it's Kepler who was key to the story. Uh, Tycho died about a year after Kepler came to work with him, and it took a while for Kepler to actually get a hold of the observations, but eventually he did, and he tried to make sense of them. Now these were pre-telescopic observations. Uh, it was still several years before Galileo first turned a telescope at the heavens. But Kepler couldn't quite make the observations of Tycho, these high quality observations, work with the assumption of circular orbits. And Kepler figured out that the orbits were uh, squashed circles, what we call ellipses. And of course there are mathematical definitions of this, but all we need to know is that Kepler in 1609 came out with a book that he called The New Astronomy, Astronomia Nova, and in the Astronomia Nova he had his first two laws of planetary orbits. The first, that the planets orbit the sun, and the sun is at one focus of the ellipses, and also a second law that has to do with how fast the planets move around the sun, depending on whether they're a little closer or a little further away. And 10 years later, he came out with a third law that links the length of time the planets take to orbit the sun with their distances. And it's this third law that is at the key for figuring out how big the universe is. If you just measure how long the planets take to go around the sun, then you can figure out in a proportion how far they are away. For example, you could tell that Mars is one and a half times further away from the sun than the Earth is. But all those distances are proportional. There's no one distance that you actually know in miles or kilometers or meters or whatever actual unit of distance you want to have. So 
The key was to find any distance that you could measure in the solar system. And if you could measure any one distance, then you can go into the proportionality and figure out all the distances. So a key to finding out how big the universe was, how big the solar system was, was to measure some distance. And in 1716, Edmund Halley, uh, of whom we know more from his comet work, uh, figured out that a transit of Venus would be the key way of figuring out the distance to Venus, and therefore the distance to the Sun, and therefore all the distances in the solar system. Now, what about a transit of Venus? Kepler had figured out there'd be one in 1631, uh, but nobody saw that one. And then Kepler uh, was dead and didn't have any prospect of calculating more. And from the tables that he had made, uh, there wasn't one right away. But a very young man, about 20 years old, named Jeremiah Horrocks in England, in Much Hool, a small town near Manchester, went into Kepler's tables and fixed things up and figured out that in 1639, there would be a transit of Venus. Venus would go across the face of the sun. He wrote a friend of his, uh, Mr. Crabtree, not too far away in Manchester. He wrote a friend in London. And at about the time, the date that he predicted this second transit in 1639, he started observing. And uh, we know that on a Sunday, he didn't observe in the morning. People are still debating why he was too young to have been ordained, but maybe he was just doing something else at church. In any case, he came home at noon and found that there was a black spot on the surface of the sun, that Venus was in transit. Mr. Crabtree in Manchester uh, also saw this. They were the only two people to see it. It was cloudy in London. And Venus looked just smaller than they expected. They just had no idea of how big things were in the solar system, how far they were in the solar system. This was just a, a real breakthrough for the transit of Venus to be seen by Jeremiah Horrocks. Now, if you look at the actual calculations, it turns out that transits of Venus take place in pairs, separated by only eight years. But then there's a gap of over 100 years, either 105 and a half years or 122 and a half years before the next pair. So after 1639, we had to wait till 1761 uh, for the next pair the first of the next pair of transits of Venus. And in that time, Halley had made his prediction. And the scientists all over the world and the governments all over the world took it so seriously that for each of 1761 and 1769, they sent out over 100 scientific expeditions all over the Earth. And Halley's method worked best if you went as far north or as far south on the Earth as possible to see the difference, make a giant triangle and figure out how far Venus was away. The most famous, perhaps, of the uh, expeditions was that of Captain James Cook. He was actually a lieutenant in the British Admiralty, uh, took this young lieutenant, gave him a ship, and said, go to Tahiti to observe the transit of Venus. And he did that. He took an astronomer with him, Charles Green, and they each uh, observed the transit. There were lots of stories to do with that. If you want to know more, there are some good books that are out about the transits of Venus and also transits of Mercury. Uh, in any case, uh, Captain Cook observed the transit very well in 1769 in clear sky from Tahiti. It was called Point Venus. It's still there as Point Venus. You can go to Point Venus, Tahiti on some excursion. And afterward, uh, he had orders that after he observed the transit, he could open a secret envelope, and he opened the envelope, and it said, go and explore the southern continent. So uh, we always consider, we astronomers consider the mapping of, of New Zealand and the coast of Australia uh, to be a spin-off of this astronomical expedition that Captain Cook made. In any case, Captain Cook and Charles Green had clear weather to observe the transit, but they couldn't time the transit as accurately as they liked. Halley's method required their timing when Venus went inside the sun in silhouette and when it exited the sun in silhouette, uh, several hours, uh, it could be six hours later. And the method required timing it to about a second, a second of time. But it turned out that when Venus went inside the sun and went a little further inside, it was still joined to the edge of the sun by uh, what you could call a ligament, it, almost like taffy that pulled out and stretched. And after about a minute, 
popped. So the timing was uncertain to about um, a minute instead of a second, and that threw off the accuracy of all the calculations. So he was unhappy, and he didn't know at the time, but everybody else who observed the transit saw that same effect, which is called the black drop effect. Guillaume Le Gentil went from Paris to observe the transit of Venus from Pondicherry, India, and he wanted to time it, of course, accurately to a second. But this Frenchman, when he got to the coast of Pondicherry, discovered that it was held by the British who wouldn't let him land, so he had to observe it from the ship. And at that time, he had a pendulum clock, and that was swinging on the ship, so he couldn't time it. So he saw it, but he couldn't make his scientific observations. So what to do? He decided to stay. It was only eight more years for another transit. So uh, Le Gentil stayed uh, in that part of the world. He went to the Philippines. He came back. Uh, and eight years later, he set up his observatory with the uh, major equipment. And it was clear, and it was clear, and it was clear. And then just before the transit started, it was cloudy. So he failed, and then he tried to get home, and he was shipwrecked, and he got dysentery, he was in the hospital, all kinds of things. He was away over 11 years. He got home to find himself um, declared dead. His goods were being dispersed to his relatives. A seat in the French Academy were given away. People dedicate themselves a lot to do certain scientific kinds of observations, especially transits of Venus, because the story is even worse for Chap Dodoroche, another Frenchman, who went to Siberia in 1761 and hated the people in Siberia so much that even Catherine the Great wrote a rebuttal to his report. In any case, in 1769, he went to Baja, California, uh, and by the time he got to where he wanted to observe, it was only a few days before the transit, and the people said, don't stop here, people are dying, they're falling ill. We now think it was typhus, but he, he said, well, I'm going to stay because I don't really have time to go to, to some other location down to Capo San Lucas. And he stayed, and he died. They all died. Um, although he did say, uh, after he successfully observed the transit, there was a, an eclipse of the moon in two weeks. I want to stay alive for that one. And he did manage to survive to the eclipse of the moon. And it is said that he died happy because he accomplished his point of his uh, goal. Anyway, I hope nobody in the current transits dies in, in their astronomical observations. The situation was much happier in the next pair of transits. I've just discussed 1761 and 1769. Now we jump to 1874 and 1882. And by that time, photography had been invented. So there were lots of photographs of that one. We still were troubled by the black drop effect. And so the method of finding the solar system by the transit of Venus, finding the size of the solar system from the transit of Venus, never really became the best method. Uh, an asteroid came close enough for them to get a good distance uh, to it and therefore find out the size and scale of the solar system. But there were lots of great observations from the transit of Venus of 1874 and 1882. Uh, this 1874 transit was especially well observed in, at Sydney in Australia, and there are great uh, drawings especially uh, from that time of the black drop effect and of other effects for the uh, transit. So now we get uh, up to the next pair, which uh, were 2004 and this coming 2012. So nobody in the 1900s had a transit of Venus to observe at all. And by the time we got to 2004, nobody alive on Earth had seen a transit of Venus. In fact, I kept up with the Guinness Book of World Records to see who the oldest person in the world was to just check that there was nobody alive who could have seen that other transit of Venus. Uh, I learned a few years before that at a meeting of the Historical Astronomy Division of the American Astronomical Society that a lot of the explanations of the black drop effect were wrong, that they said it was Venus's atmosphere that caused the black drop effect, but actually Venus's atmosphere, though substantial, was not thick enough uh, to provide that big black drop effect that is seen for a minute at the beginning and at the end of a transit of Venus. And I knew that as a solar astronomer, I had access to spacecraft observations at that time of the 1999 transit of Mercury. Now, Mercury has no atmosphere, negligible atmosphere, and the spacecraft was above the Earth's atmosphere. So when we looked at the data and we saw a black drop effect, we knew that we did not need an atmosphere to form a black drop effect. And that's true of 
Venus too. Uh, I worked with a colleague of mine at the University of Arizona, Glenn Schneider, uh, and we calculated that there were really two effects that went into the transit of Venus's black drop effect. One of the effects uh, had to do with the instrument, just the telescope had a finite size and that provided a little blurring. And the other effect is a subtle effect that is well known to astronomers that the sun and the other stars that you can't see at all as well are darker near their edges. It's called limb darkening. The limb is the edge for the sun or, or uh, an astronomical body. Uh, and that has to do with seeing into the solar atmosphere at a slant and winding up seeing a higher level, and the higher level is cooler and darker, and it's so abrupt at that point, very near the edge of the sun, where the black drop effect occurs, that that, coupled with a little blurriness from the size of the telescope, explains the black drop effect. So we had explained the black drop effect, and it was a lot of fun for me to participate in solving a problem that was hundreds of years old. We wanted to see the 2004 transit of Venus, it was all visible in an area of Asia and Europe, and I took my students at Williams College and some colleagues uh, to Greece to observe the transit so we could see uh, both uh, black drop effects and make some scientific observations too with a telescope there at the University at Thessaloniki. Uh, and we had a fine view. The transit takes six hours. It was clear almost the whole day. Uh, we did have a few clouds. Uh, in any case, we had a very good view. And then when we got back, we were able to get spacecraft observations from a NASA spacecraft called the Transition Region and Coronal Explorer, known by its initials, TRACE. And we could see in these TRACE observations that for about 25 minutes before Venus went entirely on the surface of the Sun, you could see a small arc of light around the side of Venus that was sticking off the edge of the Sun. And that really was Venus's atmosphere. That was no longer just an instrumental effect. That really was Venus's atmosphere. And we worked with a French colleague now, uh, Thomas Wiedemann, who works with a European spacecraft called Venus Express to check the, the part of Venus's atmosphere that we were observing at the time. And, uh, and we published a paper uh, in 2011 in the Astronomical Journal about these observations of the 2004 transit of Venus and how to observe Venus's atmosphere and what we detected about Venus's atmosphere then. So there's been a lot of fun to see that 2004 transit of Venus, both in spacecraft observations and with my own eyes from the ground and with my own cameras and my students' cameras from the ground. And so we're looking forward to the 2012 transit of Venus. It's listed as June 6, 2012, uh, but because of the international dateline and time zones, uh, in the United States, it turns out to be June 5th, uh, 2012. It will be entirely visible in the Pacific region, including Hawaii and Alaska, and then down to uh, Australia. Uh, on the continental United States, uh, you'll only see part of the, uh, of the transit, uh, but that's enough to see from anywhere in the continental United States. You can't look at the sun directly, it's too bright. You need a solar filter that cuts the intensity of the solar radiation down by uh, a factor of about 100,000. So you can't just use regular sunglasses. You need something like 70 pairs of sunglasses all in a row uh, in order to cut down the brightness enough. But for 50 cents or a dollar, you can buy a certain filter, solar filter, that is, makes it safe to look at. Uh, or you can just punch a hole in a piece of paper and project, uh, hold that up to the sun, and project an image onto a wall or another piece of paper from a little pinhole, so three or four millimeters across, so a little bigger than a real pinhole, but that's called a pinhole camera, and you can get a projected image of the sun, and then you can see a black spot uh, on the surface of Venus, and just the, uh, on the a black spot of Venus on the surface of the sun, Venus silhouetted against the sun. And it's just inspiring to be able to see with your own eye this very rare effect that you won't be able to see again until 2117. Of course, if you have a telescope or binoculars and you really know how to use those safely and you can project an image onto a wall with them, uh, that will work uh, too. So uh, you will have a chance in 2012 uh, to see this transit of Venus on June 5th in the United States. Uh, I will be myself on the mountain Haleakala on Maui in Hawaii where there's a solar observatory of the University of Hawaii. I have a grant from the Committee for uh, Research and Exploration of the National Geographic Society uh, 
for this work. We also have arranged with some telescopes in uh, Sacramento Peak Observatory in Sunspot, New Mexico. It belongs to the National Solar Observatory and some other telescopes from the National Solar Observatory. From the new solar telescope at the Big Bear Solar Observatory of the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And from some spacecraft. There are several solar spacecraft up now, including a new NASA spacecraft called Solar Dynamics Observatory that will get really high resolution observations of the transit. And we're working with all them to amass as big a uh, collection of these data as possible, both to study right away and to say for posterity. In fact, when we published our article in 2011 in the Astronomical Journal, uh, the editor has a, a procedure of putting your data on file. They promise to keep the data on file for 100 years. I guess they think that's good, but I responded, well, the next transit of Venus isn't for 105 years uh, till 2117 after, the, after 2012, so could you please extend your promise to keep the data on file for at least 105 years and not just the 100 years. But it is really nice for me to be able to think that these observations we made of the transit of Venus in 2004 and 2012 uh, will be of interest to astronomers and others as we come up to the next transit in the year 2117. In the meantime, people have been studying lots of stars and finding planets around them, over a thousand planets around these other stars, and we have measurements of the tenth of a percent of the sunlight that's held up by Venus in transit in 2004. We intend to do that again in 2012 and provide an, an analog in our solar system of what we're seeing in the discovery of these other solar systems. So that's fun too. So I've had a lot of fun studying the transit of Venus, something that just came on me a few years ago. Uh, and it's a great opportunity and the idea that this is our last chance on June 5th, 2012 to see a transit of Venus for another 105 years uh, means that I hope we are all outside with the proper equipment, watching safely and seeing this magnificent astronomical event.